Welcome back to Texas Cafe Classics. Uh, we had a lot of good uh, feedback from our first show about chicken fried steak. And today we're going to do another one. Uh, hamburger steak is what we're going to do today. Now, just to briefly recap, Texas Cafe Classics comes from my experience at my dad's place, Floral Heights Cafe in Wichita Falls. Uh, this was uh, in business from 1953 till about 1989. And uh, back during that period of time, uh, these little businesses were all over the state of Texas. A small Texas cafe had uh, oh, several tables in the front, usually a lunch counter. And they served breakfast, lunch, and dinner. And uh, the, the whole idea was that, that you prepared a bunch of food, put it on the steam table, and served plate lunches off the steam table. So everything was ready. The vegetables were ready. The bread was all ready. You took an order, filled it quickly. Some of your entree stuff was already prepared and ready to go on the plate, like the chicken fried steaks that we talked about last time. Those were ready. The thing we're going to talk about today is a hamburger steak, and those were made to order because they don't take very long to cook. And uh, the way Daddy made chicken fried steaks was uh, uh, he, uh, he was interested in getting the order out quickly. So it was a quick, simple, uncomplicated recipe, but the things were good. And I'm going to show you our modern version of the hamburger steak today. Now, Daddy made his own hamburger meat. He would uh, buy big pieces of what he called bull meat from the packing house. And that was probably, as I remember it, probably a brisket. And it was, it was tough and it was dark purple and it was not any fat in it. And what we would do to make hamburger meat is we had a Hobart machine and those of you that have worked in a commercial kitchen know that a Hobart machine is kind of the only thing you need because it acts as a grinder and a blender and every other thing. It's a big heavy cast iron device and it's very 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 useful in a commercial kitchen. There's no reason to have one at home because it just takes up too damn much room and I think those things are probably two thousand dollars now. I, I don't know what they what they cost but they're a hell of a bunch of money. But he used the thing all day long. Every day, all day long, he used this thing. And he it has a grinder on it, a hamburger grinder. And the grinder is on top of the machine. And it is basically an auger. So you, there's a little feeding tube that you stuff the stuff in. An auger turns and pushes it forward into a blade that is right up against a sieve plate. And it's about that big around and it's full of holes. It's a, it's a hard steel sieve plate. And the blade rotates at the end of the auger and cuts the meat as it forces it through the plate. And the, the size of the holes in the plate determined the, the fineness of the grind. He had one for chili, which made a coarse ground product. And then he had a hamburger grinder and so we made our own hamburger meat so he would take bull meat and we'd take big old chunks of this bull this purple bull meat feed it in there and grind as much of this purple bull meat as we were going to use that day and then we would take some suet some fat some beef fat and add that in and grind that all up and then when the whole thing was ground then he would put the uh the uh, little blending paddle on the bottom of the Hobart machine in this big giant pot and mix all of this stuff up and make hamburger meat out of it. And it costs about a third as much to do that as it, as it would have to pay somebody else to make the hamburger for you. So we made our own hamburger meat. Now for hamburger steaks, what he would do is keep a plate of the hamburger in the icebox in the refrigerator, a little 
commercial refrigerator he had in the kitchen. So he'd have a platter about like this. And that platter would have a big pile of hamburger meat on it. So when he got an order for check, for a hamburger steak, he would reach over to the, to the uh, fridge, open the door, grab a handful, quite literally a handful of this meat, and then he would take some chopped onions, mash that into the patty, blend it all up with his hands, and then he had a bowl of breadcrumbs. And he would take the patty, put either side of it in the breadcrumbs to coat the patty with breadcrumbs, and then blend it all into the meat. He didn't leave it as a, as a coating because we weren't trying to bread it. We wanted the breadcrumbs in the hamburger steak. And what breadcrumbs do in a hamburger steak is they absorb some of the fat and they keep the, the hamburger steak tender because you're going to fry it pretty hard on the griddle. And if you don't have breadcrumbs in this thing, it gets pretty tough. So you, uh, and this is probably a function of the fact that the hamburger meat was blended with the paddle and stuff. If you just leave hamburger meat coarsely ground and don't mix it all up, it'll stay nice and soft. But the way we made the hamburger meat, the breadcrumbs kept it tender after it was fried. And then he would fry the thing on the griddle. And as I mentioned previously, the griddle was the primary tool in a Texas kitchen for cooking things. We fried everything. And this is a big cast iron griddle about the size of your stove top at home. The thing was this big and it had three burners underneath it. And the thing was hot from middle of the morning until we closed up in the afternoon. And, uh, we fried everything on that griddle and, uh, the hamburger steaks would be put on the griddle and the patty ended up being about this big and about that thick once you got through hand forming the patty. And then he would put it on the patty, on the, on the griddle and, uh, take his commercial spatula and mash it out flat. So you've got a, a cooked face on the griddle. You turn it over to where the cooked face is up and then you mash it with the pad with the spatula and the spatula doesn't stick to the meat that has been seared on the other side. So you put the thing on the, on the griddle, you let it sear a little bit, then you flip it and then you mash it out flat and you want to mash it out to about that thick because it has to get done quickly. We're trying to fill orders here. We've got nine plate lunches hanging on the wire and we got to get them out. So the thinner the, the patty is, the faster it cooks. Now there's onions in the meat. So as the patty cooks, the onions cook along with it and the juice from the onions soaks out into the meat and the breadcrumbs and it makes just a wonderful flavor that's quite particular to a Texas Cafe hamburger steak. And we're going to show you how to make these things today. I've got a little bit different version of it that I, that I do. Since I'm not trying to get the order out, I'm going to leave the patty a little bit thicker. Uh, but the recipe for the ingredients is exactly the same. And this is how it's done. So the first thing we're going to do is you're going to chop the onions. All right. Now, uh, when I cook with onions, I don't really care too much about the kind of onion I, I use, except that it is not a purple onion, which in my uh, opinion are not fit to eat. I think they stink. They're way too strong. And they're stupid looking. Onions aren't supposed to be purple. Onions should be white, or at best, a little yellow, all right? So, you know, you can use whatever you want. Bermuda onions, white onions, those 1016. They still have 1016 onions? I don't know what the fuck that is. Well, you're just a kid, though. See, that's why you don't know. Because back a long time ago, there was a thing called a 1016 onion, and it was just sweet. It was very sweet. It had a little tiny bit of heat. And those of you... uh that 
that are, you know, at uh, adult age can probably testify to the goodness and loveliness of a 1016 onion. Used to sell them in the stores labeled as 1016 onions. So they were popular for a while, but I, I haven't seen that in quite some time. So what I'm going to do is I'm going to chop this onion and I'm going to leave it relatively coarse. I'm not going to chop it too fine because I don't like a finely chopped onion. I'm going to, I'm going to do it about like this. I'm not going to mince it is what I'm, is what I'm saying. This is just a, this is a, kind of a medium, a medium sized chopped onion. I think maybe what I'll do is make this side a little bit bigger even. And, uh, that way I have a combination of two textures of onions. Okay, now that this is chopped, I'm going to use this little bowl right here as my primary tool for mixing all this shit up. And, uh, what we will do is... Mix this thing in a bowl, and I'm going to show you the hand version of the Hobart machine. You'll be fascinated. You'll be fascinated with it because it looks so cool when I do it. All right now, that is the onions. This is the hamburger. Now, this hamburger... I have uh, a bunch of because I kill my own. I don't kill it myself. I I use. Uh, I have bought uh, custom kill meat for uh, 15, 20 years, and the patty looks like this. This ends up being about that is probably 80, 20 in terms of the mix, and I'm going to make enough to feed the crew here today. So I'm going to use two packages of this. I think these are, I can't remember if these are a pound or if they are pound or 20 ounces. I can't remember. But uh, that's the, the amount of it I'm going to use. And I think what I'm going to do is jazz this up with a little bit of beef tallow because I think that is too lean to, to taste good. So this is what I'm going to do. Now I keep some stuff in the freezer just for this purpose. This is ground leaf fat, kidney fat, off the inside of the last steer I had processed because Beef tallow, beef grease, is real, real good to fry in. Those of you that remember how good McDonald's french fries were 40 years ago, understand that one of the reasons the damn things were so good is because they were fried in this. They were fried in beef fat a long, long time ago. But then, oh my God, you know, saturated fat became rat poison, and we had to shift over to the much more healthful trans fat product that was provided to us by Big Ag. Is that who it was? Big Ag. Big Ag. So uh, this, here I'm going to put him in there. He doesn't want to break up. Now, so I've got my beef fat, my beef, and my onions in this. Now, what are we going to do about the breadcrumb problem? Well, I'll tell you what we're going to do. Uh, I'll tell you what Daddy did. What he did was, uh, of course, he made bread every day. And he, uh, he made rolls and, you know, he made a batch of white bread every single day. And we didn't use it all every time. We didn't use it all. So what we did was 
cut it up and put it in the back and let it dry out. And he would let it dry. He'd let pieces of bread dry and let the rolls dry. And when they were completely dry, he would grind them in the Hobart machine through the hamburger mill. And this generated a nice batch of breadcrumbs. And we used it for various things, but primarily for hamburger steaks. Now, we don't have access to that out here because we don't make bread and we don't have extra bread laying around. So what we have done is buy it. These are panko breadcrumbs. Now, panko is some Japanese product, right? And from what I understand, panko is made in loaves and is dried and is ground to produce this breadcrumb product. So it's essentially the equivalent of Floral Heights Cafe breadcrumbs. Now you'll remember that I said that what daddy did is he put the onions in the meat and mash them into the meat and then he'd roll the, the patty into breadcrumbs and then mash that into the meat. We're going to do it a little bit differently because it's just going to be easier this way. All right. And since we do not have a Hobart machine, we just have decided that we don't need a Hobart machine. We've got Ripito. Ready? Isn't this elegant? Notice I rotate. Notice the little hand trick there. Now, since all the onions are on the bottom, I'm going to flip the whole bolus over. And I'm going to mash it in. Now, when I get through with this, I'm going to have a mixture of meat, breadcrumbs, onions. And then, I'm not quite through mixing it, so what I'm going to do now is salt and pepper the batch. A little salty, a little peppy. This is uh, red Himalayan I noticed. sea salt. I don't know why it's sea salt if it's from the Himalayas, because the Himalayas are not around an ocean. Do you have any explanation for that? I don't either. I think that's what they call it. Do they call it Himalayan sea, or do they just call it Himalayan salt? Surely to God they don't say Himalayan sea salt. Google that while I'm finishing my mix here. The human Hobart machine, right? The Himalayans under the sea at one point? Everything was under the sea at one point, my child. Okay. Everything. Maybe that's why. Maybe. Who knows? All salt comes from the sea. Pretty much. Nope. Pink Himalayan salt. Is Pink called. Himalayan salt. So now, look what I'm going to do. I'm going to make patties. I'm going to just try to make them about the same size. And this is what they look like. Notice the thickness. There'll be some bigger than others, but you know, we're not, we don't care about that level of precision. We're just trying to make lunch here. Here's a great big one. This will be Nick's. Little baby one to be Breeze. Me and Rusty will fight over the other two. Oh, that's too big. Hold on. Here's Breeze. See the little bitty one there? Now, I'm going to make sure I don't waste any of the onions. I'm going to mash them into the into the hamburger steak. And now, we've got the steaks prepared. So now, 
We're going to cook them. We don't have a griddle. We're going to use our big cast iron pan. All right, we've got the pan nice and hot here, and I want you to watch carefully what I'm going to do. So I'm going to put the patties in the pan. If an onion falls off, it's fine. All right, now I'm going to let these sear on this, this side, and then what I'm going to do is I'm going to turn them over. And now with the cooked side against my spatula, I can mash them out nice and flat. So they'll go ahead and cook. If you try to mash out the raw side, it sticks to the spatula and it makes a mess. So just remember that little trick while you're cooking these things. Alright. Now, this is going to take a while. We're not going to get these completely all the way fried to death, but uh, we will, uh, you know, we, we, we don't want them utterly raw, utterly medium rare either. This thing needs to, since there's bread in it, it needs to be at least medium. Now, I'm going to just let those cook a little bit and uh, think about themselves. And then I'm going to flip them over. I'm only going to turn these once. Because I don't want to handle them too much. Because it makes too many of the onions fall out. It is inevitable with this kind of a hamburger steak that the some of the onions are going to fall out, and that's fine. That's fine. I'm going to kind of shove them back under the steak so that the cooked onion flavor goes in the meat as much as I can get it there. All right. And now a few more minutes. All right. I'm going to take my spatula. And cut down into the middle of these and these are about where I want them to be they're about medium all right so let me have a plate let me have that other plate Now, I'm going to get a nice hot pan here to cook the remaining two. And I'm going to pull these onions out and just put them on the lucky number three here that came out last. And then, the last two go in. And they're going to get the same treatment. I'm going to sear that side. It's already seared, it's trying to stick. Mash him out, kind of flat. This is not the kind of spatula you'd use in a commercial kitchen, but it's it's stiff enough to where it's useful in a pan, and a commercial spatula is about that long, looks about like that, and it's really too long to use in a in a 15 inch cast iron pan. Works on a griddle, but not in a pan, so this one works just fine. Okay, 
So this is what we've got is a pile of hamburger steaks here. Now uh, we're gonna pass these around like we we do. Nick, you're the oldest, so you get to go first. It's all right. It's all right. <laughs> Make a turd, won't it? Yep. At least do that. Rusty? Sir. Here, hold on. We don't want to share for it this time. That's what's up. I also want a baby bite. Need some salt. Don't give me a rip bite. No, no, you do not merit such a thing. How's that? Oh, you want the other one? Okay. <laughs> no, that's way too big. There'd be too much, too many flavors in your mouth. That's good. Yeah, it's all right. I'm going to say these things need salt. Hand me your salt shaker down there. Put some more Himalayan sea salt in it. Himalayan sea salt. Pink Himalayan sea salt from the Himalayas. Why do you like pink salt, Rip? Pink's cool. Pink's my color. Is, is that why you are pink? That's why I'm pink, because all the salt <laughs> I eat. Pink <laughs> Oh, breathe back. Oh, more. breathe for seconds? Mm -hmm. Oh, shit. She must this is like unusual. <laughs> this is really good shit, okay? It's fast, it's simple. It certainly is not French cooking. Salt and pepper, meat, onions, breadcrumbs. That's all there is to it. Don't be afraid to salt it when you get it out of the pan. I hope that you guys will go out, just like you did last time, and make this, and uh, tell me what you think. Uh, so thanks for watching us cook this stuff today. It's been my pleasure to uh, bring you a little taste of the old Texas cafe. Thanks for joining us.